Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the development of new tools for looking at CDGs. Um, one of the problems being that the molecular targets of glycosylation and the molecular basis underpinning CDGs is very, uh, very poorly understood. And so it's very difficult then to design new therapeutics that can be used for the next generation of treatments. And I'd like to talk about a stem cell-based um, solution to that today using patient-derived cells. Uh, before doing that, I want to introduce this concept of pluripotency, which is a property of stem cells in the early embryo that allows them to differentiate into all cell types in the body. In the blastocyst stage embryo, just prior to implantation, there's a, um, a pool of pluripotent cells that will eventually amplify and then differentiate during development to give rise all of the tissues in the body. And this property of a stem cell at this stage of development is known as pluripotency, meaning that it can differentiate into all cell types in the body. And so pluripotent cells are very powerful in terms of their developmental potential. Now, in the laboratory, we have access to two broad classes of uh, pluripotent stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells that are derived from surplus IVF embryos. Uh, this would be uh, from a IV human IVF clinic. And these cells can be cultured in vitro, in a culture dish, in an incubator, in the laboratory, and retain essentially all of the properties that the stem cells from the blastocyst stage embryo exhibit. The second class of pluripotent stem cells I'm going to talk about today are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And they're initially derived from adult patients or uh, any, any sort of patient. And then the cells are reprogrammed back to a pluripotent state. And I'll explain what that essentially means later on. Pluripotent cells, as I said, have the ability to differentiate into all body types, which makes them um, a very uh, broad utility stem cell type for investigating a wide range of developmental and disease processes. In the case of CDGs, we can generate many, many different cell populations that can be used as a tool for understanding this broad uh, spectrum of disease types. Now, I mentioned induced pluripotent stem cells earlier. It refers to this process whereby you can take uh, cells from um, uh, a human, uh, whether they be a skin biopsy or peripheral blood, and you can treat them with a cocktail of factors which reprograms them back to a stem cell state. This is also known as de-differentiation. The Nobel Prize for this process was in fact awarded in 2012 uh, to Shinya Yamanaka and, and since it's totally transformed the stem cell field and has really opened many, many doors now going forward to model and treat human disease including CDGs. So the process of reprogramming involves taking uh, peripheral blood or a uh, skin cell biopsy from an individual, a patient for example, and then treating them with a cocktail of uh, small molecules, drugs, or transgenes that reverse the differentiation of these cells from the patient back to a stem cell state. And so we can now generate patient-specific stem cells. These are cells that have all of the mutations in that patient and therefore represent a stem cell that can be used either for therapeutics for transplantation or in the case of diseases for modeling human disease. Uh, in humans, really, for the first time in a culture dish. So you can take these um, uh, disease, uh, these human patient uh, disease model uh, iPS cells and then differentiate them into any cell type that you desire. If the disease you're interested in, <coughs> it would be a PMN2 CDG, you can differentiate, that in, differentiate them into neurons or hepatocytes. Uh, for other CDGs, you can differentiate them to any cell type that you're interested in, depending on what the question you're asking. So these patient-derived stem cells have broad-range differentiation potential and can be used for modelling human disease in a dish, and thereby leading to a lot more information about the molecular basis of CDGs. This is just a picture of induced pluripotent stem cells. They're epithelial, and they grow as a tight, tightly bunched colony. So the... the the pathway here for modelling CDGs using stem cells is as follows. You have a patient source, so in this case this would be a patient with a CDG. You take skin fibroblasts or peripheral blood, whichever was available. 
and you add a cocktail of factors which allows these cells to be reprogrammed back to an embryonic state. So now you have a stem cell that is representative of that individual patient. And then you can perform quality control. You need to verify that the carrier type of the cells is normal and nothing's been disrupted as a result of the reprogramming process. But then you can assess the ability of these cells to differentiate into diff different cell types. Uh, for example, if you differentiate them into neurons, you can evaluate their differentiation potential and function as neurons, their survival. Uh, you, can, you can do all sorts of things. You can use these cells then uh, as p potential drug screening platforms. If you have a disease phenotype, you can then screen a bank of drugs for, for new therapeutics to uh, restore activity of glycosylation within the patient cells. We can use it for more molecular analysis because we can grow these cells up at large scale. So we can do proteomics, glycomics, uh, all sort of omics analysis to identify the molecular targets of glycosylation that are defective in uh, CDGs and, and therefore to identify targets for, for, for drugging um, and also for transplantation into animal models. I also want to make the point that we can take patient-derived cells and in fact normal patient cells and genetically engineer them in a culture dish to either introduce new mutations or correct existing mutations. So for example, we could take a stem cell derived from a CDG patient and correct that mutation, for example, in PMM2. We could correct the mutation genetically and then do experiments to show that these cells now are now fully functional. And so we now have uh, at our disposal the ability to make single or multiple mutations into uh, normal cells to create new human disease models. We can uh, uh, correct genetically patient-derived cells uh, and hopefully reverse the phenotype of the CDG of those patient cells, all in the name of trying to understand more about the molecular basis of CDGs for the first time. So this is just a little bit of a, a bit of a complicated slide, but it just illustrates the point. We can disrupt genes using this new technology called CRISPR-Cas, which allows us to de physically delete genes involved in CDGs. Or we can genetically engineer uh, point mutations or correct mutations in patient cells to correct the disease phenotype in the patient cells. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal now to model human disease from patient cells. So the general approach that I'll be talking about is to take uh, skin biopsy or peripheral blood from a CDG patient, reprogram those cells back to uh, an induced pluripotent stem cell. Remember, these cells have the ability to differentiate into any cell type in the body. So we can now address questions related to CDGs associated with any, any cell type. We then take these cells, differentiate them into the cell type of interest. It could be a neuron, for example, and thereby creating a patient-specific model for human CDG. That's the basic principle of the approach. So I'm going to talk about two case studies to show proof of concept for CDGs. Um, and this has been done in collaboration from workers at the Center for Complex Carbohydrate Research at the University of Georgia. These are three very close colleagues, Mike Tmeyer, Lance Wells, and Rich Steet. So this has been done as a, uh, a collaboration. I'm the stem cell biologist. These guys are the glycobiologists. And we all work together to try and solve these big picture problems. Of course, CDGs, it's about um, uh, decoration of uh, uh, glycolipids and glycoproteins on the cell surface in many cases, whereby we have uh, glycoproteins that are decorated with the glycans. And the problem is with CDGs, this pattern of decoration of glycosylations on these proteins on the cell surface gets deregulated. And we want to understand not only which proteins and which glycolipids are affected in CDGs, but what are the downstream effects of that. Uh, in terms of being able to understand the molecular basis of CDGs and then to identify targets that we can find drugs for that can correct the defect. Mm -hmm. The first case I'm going to talk about um, is called salt and pepper syndrome. Um, it's due to a mutation in the SD3-GAL5 gene, GM3 uh, synthase. Uh, it's been identified in one African-American family and some of the Amish community uh, in the US. Uh, and just to acknowledge Charles Schwartz, who's provided us with cells to uh, look at this. So he provided us with fibroblasts from these patients that we reprogram. Um, there's a missense mutation, it's E332K. 
um, resulting in profound intellectual disability, a failure to thrive, uh, seizures, mid-face hyperplasia, et, et cetera. And you can see the pigmented skin pattern here that's quite characteristic of salt and pepper. So what we wanted to do is try and understand the molecular basis of salt and pepper syndrome and then use this information and move forward to try and understand ways in which we could develop therapies. Now, this has been studied in uh, patient fibroblasts, uh, both normal and uh, uh, wild type, a normal patient. In zebrafish, zebrafish is used as, as a model to understand glycosylation because of its power in sort of high throughput genetics. Um, and in iPS cells. So here's just a summary of the uh, glycolipid profiles, glycoprotein profiles in um, normal, normal in iPS cells and in neural crest cells. So we're differentiating these patient cells into neural cells due to the um, issue, issues associated with uh, 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 intellectual disabilities. So the strategy is to take uh, skin fibroblasts from the salt and pepper patient, reprogram them back to an iPS cell. So this is a cell that can now differentiate into any cell type in the body. And then we differentiate them into a cell of interest. In this case, it would be neurons, but we can do other cell types as well. And once we generate neurons or neural crest cells from these patient cells, we then ask, do these cells reproduce the phenotype that's seen in the clinic? And the clinical manifestations are associated with changes in glycolipid synthesis, uh, increased cell death of neuronal populations, etc., etc. So we're trying to reproduce the disease in a dish to validate the model. And what we've been able to do is, is to do that. We take the patient-derived stem cells, we turn them into neuronal cells, and then we look at things like glycolipid uh, profiles. And this is done in Mike T. Meyer's lab. And I'll just draw your attention to lanes three and four. These are neural cells from a normal patient and a salt and pepper patient. And you can see just by glancing quickly, there are some similarities between the two, but there are some stark differences as well. And these differences in the glycolipid profile between the normal and the disease patient um, are, of course, of interest. We're following this up uh, now more specifically uh, with mass spec analysis, and you can just see, even without understanding how mass spec works, the um, profiles here in uh, normal patient uh, neural cells versus the SD3, GAL5, salt and pepper cells uh, are, are quite different. So there are some peaks that are present in the normal cells but are completely absent in the salt and pepper cells. So what we're trying to do now is understand what those glycolipids are, what the significance of those glycolipids are, and what the impact of having decreased or uh, altered glycolipids are in the patient cells. And one thing that we've been working on recently is to ask, are there any intracellular differences downstream of glycolipid synthesis? So we know there's a glycolipid synthesis defect in these patient cells, but, but so what? What does that mean? What is the impact of that in terms of how the cell behaves? Does that have an impact on cell survival? Does it, in fact, neuronal function? So we're now trying to get to these um, answers by doing detailed molecular analysis. And this is the sort of analysis that you can only do in a stem cell-derived uh, uh, type of experimental model that I'm describing here. You obviously can't go to a patient every month and say, give me a billion neurons, give me a billion heart cells, give me a billion pancreatic cells. Um, it's just not feasible. So this is what we think is the next best thing to accessing the patient's cells to do robust molecular analysis in relation to CDG. Now, just, this, is a, this is an assay just looking at signal transduction activities within normal patient cells and salt and pepper cells. And what we see, you don't need to understand the basis of it, but this is just proof of principle. Just to make the point, you can see distinct differences in the levels of some of these dots between the normal patient cells here. You can sort of see here these two black dots. This is representative, representative of ERB3 receptor activity. This is an EGF receptor family member involved in intracellular signal transduction. You don't really need to understand what that means, but it's interesting to understand that that signaling is not present in the disease state. And we think that this is because of the defective glycolipid synthesis in the salt and pepper patients. So you can sort of see where we're heading with this. Now we've got a defect in glycolipid synthesis 
a, an associated cell signaling defect, and now we're trying to understand which molecular targets are impacted by this mutation, uh, thereby leading to uh, new therapeutic development, hopefully. Um, the second case I want to talk about is uh, PMM2 CDG. We've heard a lot about that over the past uh, couple of days. We haven't made uh, so much progress with PMM2 um, as with uh, salt and pepper, but uh, this sort of just illustrates where PMM2 comes into play in the synthesis of uh, N-linked glycans. Um, and we've heard about the clinical symptoms of this already, so I won't um, elaborate on that much further. Uh, we've received cell lines from HUD freeze uh, from the Sanford Burnham. Um, we've received lines, fibroblast lines from three individual patients, and we've reprogrammed one, and that's that one that I'm going to talk about today. It's this V231M R144H mutation um, associated with PMM2. And experiments done in Rich Steet's lab, um, we've, this is essentially where we've got to with this at the moment, but I think it's exciting because it shows we can actually measure differences in the activity of the PMM2 enzyme in normal patient cells versus PMM-CDG cells. So what we've got in the black bars are normal patient cells. Uh, so these are fibroblast cells. These are normal patient fibroblast cells, and these are the normal, uh, these are the PMM2 uh, fibroblast cells over here, and these are IPS cells, uh, normal patient, and then PMM2. We can see almost a 90% reduction in PMM2 activity in this disease model system. So now we have a robust model where we can grow patient cells, detect decreased levels of PMM2, and then now seek to understand what are the glycosylation targets affected by altered or lowered PMM2 in these cells. And once we've identified the uh, altered glycosylation targets in PMM2 cells, we can then start to understand what impact that has on the cell and then start to think about drug therapeutic targets. So this is a common theme, and we need to understand the molecular mechanism in order to design rational-based therapeutics to treat these diseases. So we're funded by a uh, P41, which is a multi-investigator grant from the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. And this is a uh, pipeline of where we're at with the IPS modelling for CDGs. Um, I've mentioned ST3GAL5. We've um, been through reprogramming and are starting to characterise the molecular defects associated with ST3GAL5 uh, <coughs> mutation. Um, I just briefly mentioned uh, PMM2. This is obviously a very interesting one and, and a, a subject of a lot of interest in this room. Uh, we're now working on uh, POMGNT1 uh, and in the future um, OGT and COG7. And these are some other models um, that we have under consideration. If anybody has great ideas about what we should be doing, I'm all ears. We're, we're very interested to hear from the community where the emphasis should be. Uh, we're a small group and we sort of make decisions about priorities, but if you have any suggestions about what is a must-do, uh, we're, we're all ears and we'd be happy to incorporate that into our pipeline if we can. And we also work with uh, uh, congenital muscular dystrophies as well and we've been um, reprogramming patient cells uh, along those lines also. So I'd, I'd just like to, um, what I think I've done today is just to bring to your attention this new tool that's now available where we can use CDG patient cells to model human disease. I provided two um, proof of concept projects and I think this is going to be very applicable to a wider range of CDGs. Um, it requires obviously <coughs> a specific expertise to look at like oscillation but I think this um, sort of uh, approach is going to be widely available to the scientific community. Um, and of course, if you have any ideas about potential uh, uh, patient targets in the future, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, hear from you. I think Vanessa has my uh, email address. But I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mike, Mike T. Meyer, Rich Steed, and Lance Wells, and the people um, in, in their labs from the Center for Complex Carbohydrate Research at the University of Georgia. This is an outstanding research institute, really dedicated to understanding uh, glycobiology. And I'd just like to give a plug for, for my new centre, which has been built 